Lindbergh's central limit theorem is a tool for proving asymptotic normality for sums of independent random variables that are not necessarily identically distributed, but do satisfy some average uniformity along all of the terms in the sum. We're going to look at a special example right now where this proves something really interesting. Consider a sequence of independent Bernoulli random variables, 0, 1 valued, but not all identically distributed. In fact, we want xk to be Bernoulli with probability 1 over k. That is, the probability that xk equals 1 is 1 over k, the probability that equals 0 is 1 minus 1 over k. So these are clearly not identically distributed. They don't all have the same mean, for example. The expected value of xk is 1 over k. The variance is the expected value of the square minus the square of the expected value, but any positive power of a Bernoulli random variable is equal to itself, and so this is equal to 1 over k minus 1 over k squared. Now, we'd like to apply a central limit theorem here, and so we need to put this into the setup for the Lindbergh central limit theorem, which means we have to set it up as a standard triangular array. To do that, we take sigma n squared to be the variance of the sum of the first n variables, their independence, so that's the same thing as the sum of their variances, and so that's the sum, k going from 1 up to n, of 1 over k, minus the sum, k going from 1 up to n, of 1 over k squared. Now that second term converges, as we know, to pi squared over 6 as n goes to infinity, so it stays bounded, but the first term blows up. That sum is called h of n, the harmonic number, and it's a classical theorem that the harmonic number is approximately log n. In fact, the difference between them converges to a constant, Euler's constant, which is a little more than a half. So the variance of the sum of the first n is about log n. If we're going to set up a triangular array of these, we need the sum of the first n to have variance 1 for each n. And so what that means is that following the cues from our setup in the standard central limit theorem, we let xnk be xk centered divided by the square root of the variance, the standard deviation, of the sum of the nth row as such. Now these random variables are bounded, so they're certainly L2. They are independent since the xk's are independent, and we have just centered them. And so now we have a standard triangular array. If we want to apply the Lindbergh central limit theorem, we need to show that this array satisfies the Lindbergh condition. Now the Lindbergh condition is actually a tricky thing to prove in general. It's hard to verify. Fortunately, there's an even stronger condition, as we discussed two lectures ago, the Lyapunov condition, which is even stronger, and it turns out will hold in this situation. Normalizing as we have to form a standard triangular array, the sum of the fourth powers along each row will tend to zero. To prove that, we just expand. The fourth power of xnk is xnk minus 1 over k to the fourth divided by sigma n to the fourth. We'll pull that sigma n out front of the sum over k, and now expand xk minus 1 over k to the fourth with the binomial expansion. Now notice again that any positive power of a Bernoulli random variable is equal to that Bernoulli random variable itself, since it's 0, 1 valued. And so taking expectations of that, using the fact that xk has expected value 1 over k, this is equal to this linear combination of reciprocal powers of k. And all that really matters here is that all of these are summable sequences in k. In fact, let's just note that, therefore, the absolute value of the expected value here is less than or equal to 1 over k plus a constant over k squared. That means that this Lyapunov term is bounded by this sum. The first term there is the harmonic number, which is close to log n. And the second term here is bounded by 15 times pi squared over 6, which is certainly less than, say, 30. Now, sigma n squared, as we showed on the last slide, is approximately log n. And so this whole thing is approximately bounded by an affine function of log n divided by log n squared, which of course goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. That shows that this triangular array satisfies the Lyapunov condition. And since the Lyapunov condition implies 
the Lindbergh condition, we have the Lindbergh central limit theorem holding in this case. So for these renormalizations of those original Bernoulli random variables, the sum of the nth row converges weakly to a standard normal distribution. Let's see what that says about the original Bernoulli random variables. This sum is the sum of the centered x's divided by this cumulative variance. And so that says that the sum of the original independent but not identically distributed Bernoulli random variables minus the harmonic number divided by sigma n is approximately a standard normal, which means that just the sum by itself is approximately a normal with mean log n and variance log n, since the variance there is sigma n squared. So for large n, it's approximately a Bell distribution centered at log n and with standard deviation square root of log n. So that's interesting, but this is not just a contrived example. It turns out that this particular asymptotic normal distribution tells us about cycles of random permutations. Let Sn denote the permutation group on n letters. That is, it's the set of all bijections of the set 1 through n. There are n factorial such bijections. Here's an example of one written in sort of vertical function notation. This means that pi maps 1 to 2, 2 to 6, 3 to 5, 4 to 4, and so on. Now, that's not a very effective way to understand the algebraic properties of this group under composition of functions. It's much more convenient to write it in terms of cycle notation. What that means is that we start at some point, canonically 1, and we see where 1 goes under pi. Pi maps 1 to 2. Now 2 gets mapped to 6. 6 gets mapped back to 1. And there we have a cycle. 1, 2, 6. Now let's look at the next number which is not in that cycle, and that's 3. 3 gets mapped to 5, and 5 goes back to 3. So we have another cycle. And there's only one number left out here, 4, which is a fixed point of this permutation. I think in most combinatorics literature we would simply not write it, but for us we're going to write it as a cycle of length 1. This is the cycle decomposition of pi. We would write pi equals that. This tells us exactly how to recover pi. The cyclic order inside these doesn't matter. We could write it as 2, 6, 1 if we want. So we always write it canonically with the lowest number first. And since these cycles are independent from each other, it actually doesn't matter what order I write them. I'll still recover the same function in the end. A huge swath of combinatorics and algebra deals with the properties of this permutation group. But let's think about it probabilistically right now. We can think of Sn as a probability space, a discrete but large finite probability space. And then we can talk about selecting a random permutation. And we can talk about random variables defined on that probability space. Those are usually referred to as permutation statistics. So here is an interesting permutation statistic, the number of cycles. That is, if I select a uniformly random permutation, meaning that I put the following probability measure on this probability space, which I canonically equip with the Borel sigma field of all subsets since it's finite, this is the uniform probability measure, which just assigns equal mass to each and every singleton element of the set Sn. And now I want to sample from that probability measure and I have a random variable, cn. So for example, with this outcome, pi above, we showed that cn of pi, the number of cycles, is equal to 3. 1, 2, 3 cycles. cn is a random variable which always takes values between 1 and n. There's only one permutation that has n cycles, and that's the identity permutation, which fixes all of the elements. There are lots of permutations that have only one cycle, one example would be the full cycle, which maps 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, all the way up to n minus 1 to n, and then n back to 1. But there are, of course, many others. Now, if this were an undergraduate class, we could now proceed to try to calculate the expected value and maybe even the variance of this random variable cn. These are good problems in the method of indicators. 
and in fact are the sorts of calculations that come up in the coupon collector problem. But we'd like to be more precise. We'd like to understand what the distribution of this random variable looks like for large n. Well, in order to do that, we need to have some way of actually constructing this probability measure. Otherwise, we're going to get lost in some very complicated counting problems, which I don't want to do today. Well, it turns out that there is a brilliant way to sample from this probability measure to generate a uniformly random permutation that was invented by Feller in 1945. And it's called the Feller coupling. And here's the algorithm. Given a sequence of zeros and ones, any sequence, we can construct from that a random permutation. Now, let's be clear. I don't mean to say that there's a function from such sequences to all permutations, because the set of all such sequences has size 2 to the n, which is much smaller than n factorial, the size of the set of all permutations. This is not a deterministic procedure. Given such a sequence, I'm going to construct a permutation that still is random in its construction. And here's how we do it. At the beginning, we start at the number 1, and then we look at the sequence x1 through xn. We actually read it backwards the way that I've constructed things here. So look at xn. If xn is equal to 1, then we stop and we put 1 in a singleton cycle by itself and move on to the next step. On the other hand, if xn is 0, then we say, no, 1 is not going to be lonely. There's going to be at least one other thing in its cycle. And we're going to choose uniformly at random from the remaining n minus 1 elements to put something in the cycle with 1. And now we proceed and look at x n minus 1. If x n minus 1 is 1, then we stop and we have that single cycle, 1 and whatever element we chose before. And now for the next cycle, we choose whatever is the next lowest number that we haven't yet assigned, since that's where we usually start our cycles anyway, and proceed. And we keep going this way. At stage i, we look at, reading the sequence backwards, the value of x n minus i plus 1. If it's 1, then we stop, close off the cycle we've just constructed, and start the next cycle with the next lowest available number. If x n minus i plus 1 is 0, then we choose uniformly at random from the remaining unused numbers to include in the current cycle and proceed to stage i plus 1. Let's do an example to see how this works. Here's a sequence of length 6 of 1s and zeros. Following this algorithm, we start with 1. We look at the end of the sequence. It's a 0. That means that we don't stop here. We now choose uniformly at random from among the 5 remaining numbers. I'm going to go ahead and randomly choose 5. That's in a cycle with 1. Now we proceed to the next stage, and we look at the next term in the sequence, which is also a 0. That means that we choose uniformly at random from the remaining four numbers. I'm going to choose 2. And now we proceed. The next lowest term in the sequence is a 1. That means we're done. We close off this cycle, and we start with the next lowest number, which is 3. And we proceed. Next in the sequence, we have a 0. That means that we don't close off this cycle. We choose a number randomly from the remaining 2. I'm going to go ahead and choose 6. And now we proceed. The next lowest term in the sequence is a 1, that means we're done, and so this is a cycle of 2. And of course, there's only one remaining term in the sequence, that means that we're done one way or another, it's going to be 4 as a lonely cycle. And we have generated the following random permutation, 1, 5, 2, 3, 6, and 4. It is a permutation with 3 cycles. Now, if we would started this procedure again, we would have generated a likely different permutation. And you can quickly work out how many permutations there are corresponding to this particular pattern of ones and zeros. That's an undergraduate combinatorial probability type problem. What is fixed by this sequence is precisely the number of cycles. The permutation produced is random, but the number of cycles is just determined by the number of ones in the sequence. You will close off a cycle every time you see a 1, and so the number of cycles in the produced random permutation will be the number of 1s in the sequence. But since it's a sequence of zeros and 1s, another way to write that would be as the sum of those digits. And that brings us to Feller's coupling. Feller showed that if we choose the sequence of 1s and zeros to be independent Bernoulli random variables, 
where the parameter of the kth variable is 1 over k, like the example we just saw, then the above procedure produces a uniformly random permutation. And to be clear, there's randomness coming in at two stages here. First, we choose this independent sequence of Bernoulli's, and then we follow this procedure. And in this procedure, the uniformly random selection of digits is independent from the x's as well. If we do that, then the measure that is induced on the set of permutations under this construction is the uniform measure. That's not something that I'm going to take the time to prove right now, but it might be something that you'll see in a probabilistic combinatorics class in the future, for example. The upshot here is that our application of the Lindbergh central limit theorem now shows that this permutation statistic, the number of cycles in a uniformly randomly selected permutation, is, as n grows in distribution, approximately normal with mean log n and variance log n. This is one great example of where asymptotic normality comes up in a situation where it's not easy to see independence or identical distribution. I mentioned the coupon collector problem earlier, and I'll let you work out the relationship between this problem and the coupon collector problem, and try to understand the distribution in that problem better than the undergraduate case allowed you to before.